I would never have believed it. As they say, this can't happen. I had to see. Remember Occam's razor? There's a fool born every day. Oh yeah, buddy, that was me. Well, it happened, and when it happened, it was as the late Black Panther Eldridge Cleaver once said, somewhere in the universe, a gear shifted. My name is Steve Cornish. I guess I'm just a regular guy. In fact, I'm probably the most average guy anyone has ever met. Just turned 34, 5, 9 and a half, 180 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, master's degree in elementary education, just a fifth grade teacher in one of the best schools in the neighboring county. How about a typical boring resume? Oh yes, I was married to a beautiful blonde with blue eyes and five foot three named Mira. We had two wonderful boys, Michael was nine and Jeremy was eight. I met Mira in my senior year of college. Does any of this sound familiar? She was 20 and worked as a secretary at a large law firm downtown. We met at a dance club. She was with a bunch of girls and I was hanging out with my friends from school. I asked her to dance and well, that's where it all started. In June, immediately after receiving our diploma, we got married. I already had a job, in the same place where I work now. Her parents threw a lavish reception, a church wedding, five bridesmaids, a flower girl, a ring boy, a reception with an open bar at a country club. We went on our honeymoon to Vegas. We never saw the casino and barely had time to eat. For the next 11 years, we did everything right. Gave birth to two boys, rented a small apartment, bastards, and bought their first home. Everyone knows what I'm talking about the old equity building property. We saved and saved. She stayed home until the boys went to school and then returned to work, initially working only between the morning and afternoon school buses. In the evenings I sat with the children while she went to courses that gave her status paralegal. I made a little extra money in the spring coaching the high school lacrosse team and worked for a construction company hammering nails in the summer. By the end of the winter of our eleventh year, our sixth in our first home, we were ready to move into our dream home. We searched and found our dream home in one of the new residential areas thirty miles from the city. It made my commute longer, but it ended up being one of the best places to raise kids. It started slowly, but as we planned the move, Mira's behavior changed. Before we started moving, we always looked at things as a team discussed and made decisions, which usually involved compromise. But Mira's attitude changed. She started to become the boss. She said she was becoming more determined. I felt that she was becoming more autocratic and perhaps a little impolite, if not disrespectful. But I loved her, so I didn't attach any importance to it. The house we found was on a two-acre lot on the edge of an already developed area. I preferred a house at the end of one of the cul-de-sacs, but Mira was adamant she needed a larger plot. She was planning a swimming pool in the near future. Like I said, Mira really took matters into her own hands. We needed all new furniture, so that meant trips to the best furniture store in the area Frobisher. I needed a lawnmower. Without any consultation, she ordered one of those newer John Deere tractors. I would have been happy with a used Cub Cadet, but Mira disagreed. She checked Consumer Reports and probably Better Home and Garden Magazine. She decided that John Deere was what she needed. There was a barn on the property. It was not large enough. Carpenters were hired, and soon a new, larger barn appeared on the site of the old barn. I thought things like barns and lawn tractors were men's things. Well, what did I know? Mira was worried about the boys, especially regarding its availability. If a problem suddenly arose, she, in her opinion, had to quickly get home or to school. We used to live next to the school. Now everything has changed. Mira could not stay in the same place and feel safe. She looked through the newspapers and found a law firm in the center of the county that was looking for a paralegal. She applied and got the job almost immediately. This put her just 15 minutes from work and less than five miles from her children's school. I wasn't sure but I thought there might be a problem or two when she came home and talked about her new job. She said, Steve, I got the job and it's a 20% raise. Plus, I will receive limited gas reimbursement and one of their secretaries will do a lot of my clerical work. 
there are only one or two small nuances. She said nuances in her new authoritative tone. I wondered what these nuances were. I found out pretty quickly. Mira explained, Honey, they are much more businesslike than my old office in the city. I will have to wear more formal clothes, so I will need a new wardrobe. And one more thing, they have a happy hour on Fridays at one of the restaurants a few blocks from their office, and I will have to attend. We had both been to this area, and I thought we had explored everything thoroughly. I asked her, what is the name of this restaurant? She said it was a quiet place called the Wagon Wheel Inn. When she mentioned Wagon Wheel, a little light bulb seemed to go on. Not suspicion, but simply an alarming light. I passed by this place. I saw this cozy place, and it certainly wasn't what I would call a family restaurant, even on a good day. I told her, I saw this place, honey. I don't like that you go there on Fridays, at least not without me. Then the light bulb lit up even brighter. She gave me the first of her new standard answers. What do you know? Have you ever been there? Have you tried their food? Have you checked the clientele? My new bosses love it. If they like it and it's part of the job, then I'll like it too. Here is another unpleasant circumstance that I mentioned. When Mira and I met, courted and got married, she was one person, but over the years of our marriage, there was a slow and then not so slow metamorphosis. When we met, she was this playful, flirtatious minx who moved from table to table, entertaining everyone with a wildly funny and innocent girl. She always dressed smartly. By this I mean cute miniskirts, snowy white button-down blouses, low heels, sometimes even knee socks. She usually tied her hair up with bobby pins or sometimes had one of those amazing ponytails that swung back and forth when she jumped. She was light, airy, witty, and simply pleasant to talk to. She didn't wear much makeup, but I certainly didn't think she needed it. Did I say she was popular? Well, she was incredibly popular. Once I had my sights set on her, I had to fight off the competition with a stick. Sometimes I felt like I was standing in line. I think I asked her to marry me about eight times before she agreed. I remember our wedding day. Her father walked her down the aisle in this beautiful white dress, all embroidered with rich satin lace, with a long train and that veil. I say she was absolutely amazing, and when I lifted her veil, I saw these soulful big blue eyes. I mean, the love I saw there was palpable, you could cut it with a knife. We went to Vegas, and yes, we left the room. She had the kind of body that other women would kill for, and when she was in that white swimsuit, there was no doubt she was completely fine. In public in the early years, she remained the same sweet, capricious girl I married and loved, but at home in bed, she became a tigress. At first, she was a little reserved, a little timid about sex, but it didn't take her long to discover and appreciate all the joys of love. Why do I remember all this? I think because, like all good things, it gradually came to an end. My capricious little one has become, how can I say, more controlling, more prim. I think that's the right word. Things we both used to find fun became, she said, tiresome. Even our sex became different, especially after she got a new job in the county. Looking back, I can see it, but at the time, it just creeped up on me. A lot started to happen during and after our big move. Looking back, I see how everything fell apart, but, as I said, this is a look into the past. I think one of the reasons was my insecurity. We've been pretty frugal throughout our marriage. The big crash in the housing market passed, and we managed to avoid it. We tried to save as much cash as possible to maximize our down payment and thus minimize our monthly mortgage payment. Mira has not yet found a new job, and her travel time, like mine, would be an additional burden. I had a regular pension from the County Plus, a 403B that we started. We agreed to close my 403B and her 401K. We will take a loss when the time comes and close it to add some capital for the down payment. I was still worried. We had been looking for a house for several weeks and had several options, but she loved this particular one. I liked it too, but the sellers wanted the decision to be made immediately. I was in favor of waiting a few more months to get another house and a better offer. Mira wanted this house and refused to wait. 
Mira was determined, and I gave in. Of course, everything worked out. We had the money, everything worked out. She got a new job, and looking back, all my fears seemed pointless, even stupid. Unfortunately, my caution will later seem like cowardice to her. My reluctance to jump as quickly as she wanted looked like fear to her. Yes, I lost a little respect there. Not surprisingly, all my subsequent proposals to slow down were met with contempt. I'm just a teacher. She has a legal mind. I worked with children all day. She worked with adults. Once we moved into our new house, I started getting these little reminders of my shortcomings from time to time. Another big thing that played against us, which I feel guilty about, was my work. Of course, fifth graders are children, but teaching is more than snotty noses and broken glasses. I had real problems. I won't go into details, but they definitely were. First of all, the fact is that I had a very real career path. I took and passed the supervisory and administrative exams. I completed training and interviews for various positions. There was a bit of a baby boom in the district, and I was being promoted quickly from classroom teacher to assistant principal and then possibly to principal. I was noticed at the state level, and there were opportunities there too. Throughout the state, elementary education was going through another round of changes, and one of the areas affected by these changes was the way reading was taught. There were numerous theories, but the main two at that time were visual method and phonetics. With the visual method, the child sees a picture, sees a word, and remembers it. In the phonics method, the child learns the alphabet and sounds, and then matches the sounds with the letters. This is a gross simplification, but in my opinion, the first method expects children to remember thousands of words independently, without any connection. In the second method, the child learns letters and their sounds, and then simply breaks each word into parts. In the second method, the child learns a code. Everyone remembers sound word. And so, when we moved, the visual method dominated. I preferred the phonetic system, and because of this, I was under a lot of pressure. I have already come to school several times about this. I wrote my opinion and did extensive research. I became a regular at school council meetings and made a few enemies. Of course, the main thing was that I was often at evening council meetings. The third professional problem I encountered involved child abuse and, in one case, child neglect. Teachers were required to report any suspected abuse or neglect. I had a child who came to class day after day without lunch, without lunch money, and almost never changed clothes. I expressed my concerns to the director, and she said I needed to continue. I trusted her support, but when I contacted social services, I found myself in a difficult situation. Now I was angry, and I knew neglectful parents were haunting me. So I was losing respect at home, trying to advance my career in the county or state, fighting for outdated educational theory, and trying to help a child. Plus, it was spring when we moved, and I was coaching a junior lacrosse team, and also had kids to plan and teach. Anyway, we bought a house, she got a job, bought a new wardrobe, enrolled the kids in school, and life went on. Mira told me about her employer. It was a small office with five lawyers, six secretaries, an office assistant, and her. Of the lawyers, three were partners, one was a senior consultant, and the last was a classic rookie. I heard about all the partners, too. There was an older man with the big clients, the older man's lazy daughter who came when she wanted, and a business-like 30-year-old man who did most of the work. I didn't think much of it. We already went through this when she worked in the city. I will say, Mira's new wardrobe was impressive. She bought new dresses and new suits high heels, matching bags, new expensive watches, and also new glasses. All this gave her an additional professional appearance. She looked amazing, and I felt the same way. She was confident, confident, and perhaps a little arrogant. So I was busy, Mira was busy, the kids were busy, life has become more rapid. April, May and June flew by and July arrived. Mira came home and announced that her office always had a 4th of July party the week after the 4th. They did this the following week so as not to interfere with family activities. I thought it was wonderful. School was out, the boys were off to day camp, 
and I was back hammering nails. I felt good. Then we went to an office party. The party took place at the private home of a senior lawyer. Man, it was great. A huge brick house set back from the main road. He had a large backyard with a swimming pool, a tennis court, a beautiful garden, and all the trappings of a truly rich man. Mira and I arrived around 1 p.m. as expected. Almost everyone else was already there or coming. I didn't know many people, so it was an interesting experience. We had done these types of events many times at her old office, so I knew my role. I was supposed to be a pleasant, quiet, polite, modest husband. I would have been like that if I hadn't discovered something almost immediately after arriving. All the other lawyers, their wives and significant others were not important, only the 30-year-old hard worker and his wife. The lawyer's name was Wendell Standish, not Van or Wendy or Dell. No, he didn't have a nickname. He was Wendell, with the emphasis on the second syllable. Mira didn't mention him often, and I understood why. That son of a bitch looked like a GQ model. Look, I'm not bad. I have biceps, I have shoulders, and my stomach is flat. No ripped abs, but definitely flat. Well, Mr. Wendell Standish looked like Adonis Incarnate. He was tall, six feet three inches. He had gorgeous, thick, wavy blonde hair, light blue eyes, a perfect tan and abs of steel. He just oozes sex appeal. The only person at the party who could compare to him was his wife, and she was amazing. She was almost my height, had beautiful light brown hair, eyes the color of ghee, a perfect face, and a body that other women would kill for. The only difference I noticed between Mr. and Mrs. Charming was their behavior. While our hero exuded confidence and that social politeness that comes only with continuous success, she exhibited an uncertainty and tension that could only be associated with inner doubts and fears. I don't know if anyone else noticed these things, but I certainly did and understood why. We've all been there. Everyone was supposed to have a good time, and from the moment I arrived I knew. I knew something was wrong, something was terribly wrong. Mr. Charming had this uniquely smug look every time he looked in my wife's direction. The only way to describe it is to compare it to someone looking at a restaurant menu and seeing a dish that they have already tried and know is delicious. I looked at my wife and saw the same look. Then I looked at Allison, the wife Wendell. She noticed it too, and I knew she saw what I suspected. But from the defeated expression she showed, I was also sure that she had been through this before. My main concern from that moment was whether what I saw was an acknowledgement of a fate accompli or something that was expected but had not yet been realized. Now the world is modern. Marital infidelity is too real and too cruel a reality. Everyone knows someone who has experienced it, and the descriptions are always starkly and strikingly the same. Comparisons are always about death. The death of a marriage, the death of self-esteem, the death of innocence, the death of trust, the death of a lifelong dream. I saw the new Superman. I saw my wife, and it seemed to me that I was dying. I wanted to crawl into some hole and cover myself with earth. One memory kept haunting me. I knew it was stupid. I kept remembering the old book about the Black Scandal Socks 1919. There was a boy looking at shoeless Joe Jackson with tears in his eyes, saying, Say it ain't true, Joe. Tell me it's not true. Oh, Mira, I thought, tell me it's not true. I had to go. I walked over to the drinks cooler, pulled out a soda, and headed toward the picnic tables. The food had not yet been served, but I wanted to be alone. When I approached the tables, I realized that I would soon have company. Mrs. Standish was soon standing next to me. I turned, smiled, and said, Hi, I'm Steve, Mira Cornish's husband. Are you the wife of Wendell Standish, aren't you? She smiled and shook my hand. Yes, Allison. I saw you when you approached. You're both new to the community, aren't you? I held her gaze in a friendly manner and replied, Yes, we have only been here for a few months. I liked her immediately. She was not only beautiful, I felt that she was truly a wonderful and nice person. She asked, Do you have children? Two boys, I said. They just started at Broad Mill Elementary School. She touched my hand again. Wendell and I also have two, a boy and a girl. 
They also study at Broad Mill. I said, heard this is a good school. She replied, pretty good. They have some problems, some new ideas about reading. I haven't gotten into it yet. God, she got right into my flow. I told her what I was doing. She said she used to teach high school science before her children were born. From then on, her husband wanted her to stay at home. She reluctantly agreed. I hate to admit it, but with the exception of a few short outings to the others, just out of politeness, Allison and I were together almost all the time. I think Mira noticed this. Hard to say. I'm sure Wendell didn't notice. I know I had a great time. I watched my wife carefully. I noticed two things all day. First, although there was eye contact, Wendell and my wife did not approach or speak to each other, and second, I realized that Miro was secretly watching me like a hawk. I knew my wife. I don't think she was following me out of jealousy. I think she was more concerned that I noticed that she wasn't interacting with certain people. But who knows? Miro was a woman and women. Well, towards the end of the day, after everyone had eaten the burgers, hot dogs, ribs, and all the accompanying salads, and everyone had gotten dessert, the party began to break up. The second to last thing I did was get Allison's cell phone number and give her mine. We agreed to meet later in the summer if there was time. The ride home started quietly, but it didn't last long. Mira sat in the passenger seat, smiling softly, one of those crooked smiles that foretell trouble. You've met everyone I work with. I mean after I stopped hanging around Miss Standish. I replied smugly, Yes, they are good people. I liked everyone. She wanted to start a conversation. Really, I'm a little surprised. You haven't left Allison's side all day. She added a little snark to Allison's name. Perhaps Mira was a little jealous. I doubt it, but it was nice to think about it. I continued to look at the road. You knew she used to teach science. They have two children, a boy and a girl, who study at the same school as Michael and Jeremy. Mira grinned. Mine, I think you'll have something to talk about this summer. That was one more thing. My job as a carpenter in the summer brought in good money. Not as much as if I were a full-time employee of the school, but it was a decent amount. This summer I suspected that she thought something else would happen. Hell, my job wasn't easy or partial. Sometimes I would leave at dawn and not return until dark. It was hard and tiring work, and I enjoyed it. There is a difference between sweating and sweating. Sweating means working indoors, and sweating means working outdoors. I still decided to tease her a little. We agreed to meet. You know, talk about children and school and stuff. She grinned, and it was a real grin this time. I'm sure she will. I changed the subject. I like the people you work with. She switched gears too. They're a great band. I asked, which lawyer gives you the most work? She became wary. Why do you ask? Just wondering. Mr. Standish is the hardest worker. I think I get most of my work from him. I continued, when you travel, does he come with you? Sometimes, she said, usually the only time I go is when someone wants to update a will or when there is a settlement going on at the bank rather than at the office. We go together for things like this. I'm a notary, that's part of the reason. Who do you hang out with on your happy Fridays? She wasn't paying much attention. Oh, mostly with lawyers. She woke up and turned around. Why do you ask? I lied. Some girls were talking. She paid full attention. What did they say? I changed the subject. Oh, look. I pointed out the window. Is that a coyote? There was nothing there. I just wanted her to think. She turned, looked, and turned again. I didn't see anything. Why did you say that? What did the girls say? What a girl. I should have said something. I don't remember. I don't know. Maybe Marcia. Mira looked at me, really looking. It's a small office and Marcia is a pain in the ass. I smiled. Don't worry. It's probably just office gossip. She relaxed a little, but I noticed that she was sitting very straight. Yeah, when we get home, pick up the boys. I want to wash my face. Of course, I said. We drove home in silence. 
Later I took the boys. They were pretty tired. I washed them while Mira prepared them a snack. A little later they went to bed. I stayed downstairs, turned on the TV and waited, and waited, and waited. I checked my watch. It was already after nine. I half expected Mira to come down to me. Since we moved into our new house, the denim mina dress has faded, but I still had hopes. I had to remember what my dad always said. When you start to think you can count on a woman, that's when you can't count on her. Don't try to understand them, he said. It's like trying to understand a possum. I gave up. I went upstairs and saw that Mira was fast asleep. I went to bed and decided to seriously think about the situation. So, we've been married for almost 11, no, 12 years. We lived in an apartment, then in a small house to build capital, and now in a big house. Mira finished her studies, got one, then a second job. We had two wonderful boys. I was proud of them. I had a good job, a career in progress, and no serious debt other than a mortgage and some furniture costs. What about your social and personal life? We haven't had any receptions since we moved. We didn't see any of our old friends and didn't make any new ones. We went to the Presbyterian Church where we got married, but after moving we looked around and didn't settle on anything. So no churches and no social life. What about our personal lives, our emotional and sexual lives? We used to plan something at least once a week, and we had a lot of spontaneous meetings. Mira used to tease me with her body so that I would chase her around the house. The kids were usually somewhere further away so we could do this. There was no teasing, no flirting, no planned meetings for some time. When was the last time we had sex? Memorial Day weekend. It was on the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. We visited her parents. The kids were tired, so we put them to bed and then went to bed ourselves. Memorial Day is the end of May. It was now the first week of July. What happened? Okay, what happened on Memorial Day? I remember it was fast. Mira was tired and wanted to sleep. I drank, but Mira never drank, so why was she so tired? Is she really tired? I couldn't remember. What has happened since Memorial Day? Nothing. I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't even remember the kisses. Okay, we've been busy. I finished the school year, then started my summer job. Mira worked hard on hers. I remember I had to tune her car. She traveled a lot for work. I never asked, was it to update people's wills? We haven't spoken lately. We talked, but not like before. In the past, we talked about plans, the future, children, the future of children, her parents, my parents, and her old grandmother, who was her most beloved person in the whole world. She never mentioned it, I didn't mention it either. But we talked. What were we talking about? We talked about my work and my shortcomings. We argued a little. She once called me teacher's boy. She just said it to be mean. This was something new. She had never spoken or acted like that before. Where did this come from? I knew we had a respect problem. I remember being humiliated at least twice for being, what did she say? I was too inexperienced too. What word did she use? I was too naive. I was naive. I didn't know anything. She said I didn't know anything. This was a new phrase for her. This is not a feminine phrase, no, this is a masculine phrase. We were at a party today. One day I was next to the charm guy. He and one of the lawyers were talking about business. What charm guy said, he said, so and so didn't know anything. Well, I think I know where Mira got the new nothing from. I was lying on my back, in my bed, next to my wife, in my house, and I knew I had a problem. So what am I going to do about it? Deciding what to do, damn it, won't be easy. Then it dawned on me, I don't think I was alone. I knew I wasn't alone. I sat up in bed. What did I do with this piece of paper? I stood up and put on the trousers I wore to the party. I fumbled in my pocket. Ah, here it is. I took out my cell phone and wrote down Alison Standish's number. I tore the paper, went back to bed and fell asleep. I slept like a baby. My wife, my wonderful, so sophisticated, rising wife, forgot one thing. Her husband, her teacher's boy. He knew a few things about teamwork. The next morning we all got up almost at the same time. 
The boys woke up, cheerful and just as noisy as they should be. Mira looked annoyed about something. I looked at her. I'm going to go out for a while. I don't know when I'll be back. She looked at me like I had just stolen her wallet. Where are you going? I smiled. Just get out. She said, Just get out? What kind of answer is this? I plan to go to Walmart and then grocery shopping. I thought you would look after the boys. I just kept smiling. Take them with you. I have plans. We both looked at the boys. At this moment, they behaved like real tomboys. Mira looked at me pleadingly. You can't. No, I have plans. I finished my coffee, put on my tennis shoes, grabbed my keys, and headed to the car. I drove a Ford Explorer. Mira drove a Chevy Suburban. I got into the car, started it, drove off, and drove away. I caught a glimpse of Mira looking out the living room window as I drove away. I think she'll have a wonderful day with the boys. And where did I go? Nowhere. I drove down the street, took out my phone, and called Allison. To my surprise, it was not Allison who answered the phone, but Wendell. He said, Hello. I replied, Is that Wendell Standish? He said, Yes, who is it? I told him, This is Steve Cornish, Mira's husband. Allison, your wife, gave me this number. Is she there? He said, Yes, that's her phone. I'll call her now. I heard some sounds in the background and some noise. I think I heard the kids, but I clearly heard Mr. Charisma say something like, This is Steve Cornish. Why is he calling? Why did you give him your number? I heard Allison Standish's voice on the phone. Hello, Steve. Steve Cornish. I replied, Yes, I decided to call and find out how you got home. She laughed. This is stupid. Why did you actually call? I replied, I don't know exactly. I guess I just wanted to talk. Are you busy right now? She said, Are you serious? I replied, Of course. We just finished breakfast. Do you want to meet somewhere? I heard her laugh. Then I heard her say to her husband, This is the husband of your paralegal. He wants to meet me today. There was a pause, then, I don't know. Do you mind if I go? Another pause. Sorry, Steve. Wendell wants me to stay home today. Maybe next time. I answered the phone. Okay, I'll call you another time. I heard her laugh. Yes, please call. I hung up. I started the car again and drove to the mall. There was a movie there that I wanted to watch. I checked my watch. The shopping center was, of course, open. I could wander around the shops until the movie starts. That's what I did. I went to the mall and basically just wandered around. I went to a bookstore. I didn't find anything. Checked the music store. Nothing, too. I went to a sports store. The prices were inflated. I looked into one of the anchor department stores, looked at the underwear, and bought a pair of panties. Mira wore a size 6, so I bought a size 8. I went to the cinema, bought popcorn, and enjoyed myself. The film came to a thrilling end a little after four hours. I got into the car and drove home. I left a bag of panties on the passenger seat of my car. Maybe Mira will find them. She will see that they are not her size. Maybe she'll wonder who I bought them for. Maybe she'll start to worry a little. When I got home, the boys were playing Wii or something in the lounge. Mira was preparing dinner in the kitchen. It smelled delicious. It was a dish that I liked. I also noticed that Mira was wearing a nice little miniskirt and one of those cropped blouses. I smelled her perfume. I walked into the kitchen. She smiled. Did you have a good day? I said, not bad. I sat at the kitchen table while she made fresh coffee. She seemed overly cheerful. We sat at the table, drank a cup of coffee, and talked about nothing in particular. I wouldn't say she was trying to be particularly nice. I'd say she was more like that to the world, which I loved. We had dinner. The boys behaved better than usual. I wondered if she was giving them a lecture. We put them to bed at about nine. They had an early bus to day camp. By ten o'clock only Mira and I remained. I wonder if she received any calls on her cell phone during the day. Maybe a call from someone at work. Maybe a call from Mr. Macho Man. 
We talked for a while and around 10.30 she crawled over to me, took my hand and led me upstairs to our bedroom. Oh yeah, I thought, that was better than I hoped. The next morning we sent the boys to camp. We drank coffee and ate a bagel together. We talked about the day ahead. We kept the conversation on light topics. She carefully avoided looking at me. If she had looked, she would have seen the smiling, happy, and to everyone around him, innocent cuckold. We both got into our cars and drove away. Around noon, I called Allison Standish. Hey, Allison. She started laughing as soon as she heard my voice. She said, I don't know what you did, but yesterday was amazing. I asked, how so? She replied, I think an hour after you called, Wendell left the house. I returned maybe an hour later with a dozen red roses and a bottle of my favorite perfume. He sent our kids to a neighbor's house, and we had the best lovemaking session we've had in months. I asked, you know why, don't you? She paused, her next response downright gloomy, I guess so. I asked, do you know what we should do next? No, I don't know, she replied. I think I heard her son. This made me a little angry. Her unhappiness was just part of the dishonesty of her husband and my wife, talking about cruelty. I told her, listen, it's still early. That's what I want you to do. You know that little baker coffee shop on Main Street called Burleson? Yes, she replied. I want you to go there. Order two identical cakes. They don't have to be big. They don't have to be anyone's favorite, but they do have to be the same. Tonight, when your husband returns home after dinner, take out the cake and cut him a piece. Tell him that this is gratitude for all the love he gives you. Say something like, it's because I know how much you love me. You understood. I continued, now you ordered two identical cakes. You have one. I'll stop on the way home and pick up the second one. I'll give it to Mira. I'll try to tell her something like that. I heard Allison seem to come to her senses a little. Oh, Steve, this is confusing. I laughed quietly. Don't show it. If he asks you anything, you don't know anything. I'll call you as soon as I can. I think I'll take Wednesday off. We can meet and talk. She said, Steve, you're terrible. I said, no, they're the ones who are terrible. Hang in there, Allison, okay? She quietly replied, I'll go get the cakes right now. I ended the day in a pretty good mood, and I guess I was optimistic. I more or less figured out what I want. One could only hope that Mira wanted the same. I stopped and bought a cake, beautiful, with chocolate icing and vanilla filling. I brought it home. The boys took a piece, but didn't finish it. The cake was too rich. Myra took a small piece. I also bought pizzas so no one would have to cook dinner. The boys were tired after camp, so it was easy to put them to bed. By nine o'clock in the evening, we were again left only with Mira. We sat on the couch and watched TV. She sat quietly with her hands folded in her lap. I bet my opponent and my wife talked about my call to Allison. About 10 o'clock I said, should we go to bed? I want to make amends for what happened last night. She smiled the sweetest smile. I thought maybe things would get better. We went to bed. She was as indecisive as she had been in the first months of our marriage. Most of all, I wanted her to understand how much I loved her and what she could possibly lose if she acted foolishly. On Tuesday, we got up and went according to the usual pattern. In the evening, when we all returned home, I was not very surprised. She was almost completely silent. She looked nervous and twitchy all evening. Oh yeah, I thought. The two cats definitely knew something was going on. I thought they were definitely talking about cakes. My guess was that people who cheated became lazy and forgot about the person they loved enough to marry. After all, they were safely locked at home, remaining stupid, blind, faithful, and stupid. But what if the cheater began to think that their stupid, blind, stupid, gullible spouse does not sit at home and does not look after the household? What if Mr. or Mrs. Too Dumb to Know decided to take a page from the trader's book and write their own chapter? Wouldn't that ruin someone's day? I like to think that my contact with Allison might have undermined Mira's self-confidence, her sense of balance. If not, 
then I was completely wrong about her, and I would be stupid to stick around. I took Wednesday off and Allison, and I met at the candy store. I arrived first, but she didn't stay. We had several questions to discuss. When she came in, I stood up and offered her a chair. How are you feeling? I'm not sure, she replied. Wendell saw the cake, took a piece, but didn't say anything else. The next day when he came home, he was acting strange. I think they might have compared notes. I don't know what to do with him. Let me ask you, Allison, has Wendell ever done anything like this before? She sighed and replied, Yes, I think so, but I was too afraid to say anything. I think it was another lawyer. It might have lasted about six months, then it ended. I asked, How did you know it was over? She sobbed and I was afraid she wouldn't be able to handle what I had in mind, but she said, Oh, he was a real beast to me for a few months. He was rude and talked down to me all the time. I felt like that. Helpless, then one day it just stopped. He was himself again. He was always an arrogant bastard, but I love him. I started, I think they've been doing this for about a month. My guess is it started around Memorial Day. Allison nodded and said, that seems true. Let me ask you, Allison, what do you want to do? Her eyes grew big. I don't know. I love him, but it hurts so much. I don't know how many more times, but there are children. I took her hand. I think this is Mira's first time. I've thought about it. I have my boys, and I really love her. If I can find a way to stop this and ensure it never happens again, I'll try. And you, Allison? She sobbed. I love him. He's been good to me for most of our marriage. I have kids, and honestly, it's nice not to have to work. I took her hand in both mine. Okay, I think we can fix this. If my idea works, we'll be fine for a long time, but it has to be together. She interrupted. I don't want anything, you know? I squeezed her hand. No, Allison, this is not revenge. This will be a rescue operation. I'm going to try to forgive Mira, but I'm going to make sure this never happens again. I will take appropriate action if I deem it necessary when the time comes. And if Wendell really loves you, then everything will work out for you. I'm sure Myra loves me. I just think she's lost. I've read about it. Allison looked more cheerful. Okay, what's the plan? I leaned forward. First of all, tonight when they both get home, I'm sure they'll be discussing the cakes and trying to figure out what to do. It might be enough to separate them. If not, they'll need more convincing. Allison chuckled. What's the plan? I smiled. You have to trust me. I'll let you know when the time is right. She giggled a little. Okay, so they'll come home tonight and... We talked some more. I told her what was needed and we left. Mira came home on time. Since I took the day off, I used the extra time to vacuum and mop the kitchen and bathroom floors. Usually these were general duties, but doing this on a Wednesday was unusual. What was unusual was my decision to change the bed linen, wash it, and hang it outside. I had just finished when she pulled up. I could see the worry in her eyes from a mile away. One thing I read, a cheating spouse sometimes goes to extreme lengths to be nice. My cleaning and laundry could confuse her. She walked around the house and out into the backyard, where I was taking the last of my clothes off the line. Oh, Steve, you came home early. I turned around and walked over and kissed her on the cheek. I took the day off. You've been so good to me the last few days that I had to do something to show my gratitude. She smiled, but it was a tense smile. I thought the cake was more than enough. It was time to escalate. Nothing is too good for my girl. You know how much I love you. You come first in everything I do. She almost recoiled from it. She changed the subject. You did the laundry. Only the bed linen. Ours were pretty dirty. I gave her an evil smile and then added fuel to the fire. I like to do things for my favorite mistress. Then I threw the lit match. In bed, you're my number one. I'm sure I saw the hesitancy, but she handled it well. You're the devil, she replied. I thought we were having spaghetti dinner tonight. Is that okay with you? I responded somewhat subduedly. 
Perhaps we could eat out. Curious, she asked, where exactly? I thought about the wagon wheel. Oh yeah, her face showed guilt and fear. Why there, she asked. I don't know, you go there often. You might know what's good on the menu. Allison said the food is good there too. The mention of Allison was like a needle in her ego. She looked away. Let's eat dinner at home. I know the boys want spaghetti. Okay, was my calm response. I took her hand and we went inside. While she was going upstairs, I pulled out my next surprise. Wendell gave Allison a dozen red roses on Sunday, and I'm just sure he told Mira. I couldn't let him outdo me. Myra came down a few minutes later. She rinsed off in the shower and put on a beautiful dress. She looked amazing, but I couldn't help but wonder if there was another reason for a quick shower. I didn't want to use her cell phone to spy on her, but she had state-of-the-art equipment, and while I may still have been just a teacher to her, I knew my electronics. My real concern was whether I really wanted to know more than I needed to. Until now, I could pretend that she and Wendell didn't do it. I was pretty sure they did, but if I found out too much, how would that affect my feelings later? No, the cell phone game could wait. All this infidelity, uncertainty, the way the mind works, man's natural curiosity, all this could lead to different thoughts. I was thinking about someone's problems, which were pretty big news a couple of years ago. In fact, it came up again not too long ago. There was this four-star general who got caught with his hands in the cookie jar. It seemed that a slightly younger woman, also a West Point graduate, had gotten the chance to write a book about him. Well, from what I've read between the lines of the usual greasy news, she lost her head, there was some sort of seduction, and they ended up doing dirty things behind their spouses' backs. The media took it up and made a real feast. It turned into a real witch hunt. They talked about meetings in hotels, about sex on the table, about the use of special sex toys. These were the kinds of things that could easily undermine the confidence of a betrayed spouse. It was already difficult for me. I didn't have to think about such things. The general was even promoted to a higher position in the government, but then their secret was leaked, he had to resign, and she ended up at home with her mom and dad. I almost giggled. I am not a political person, but the general was proposed as a candidate for the elections against our current president. Shortly before his unmasking, he seemed like a viable choice. I wonder if the president himself contributed to this entire explosive situation. The romance didn't end there. The woman had a husband and two young sons. The man, I remember, was for a time a national fool, like the cuckold of the year. I thought he would leave her dirty ass, take the boys and leave the ranch, but he surprised everyone. At least he surprised me. He allowed her to return. I thought about it. Those little boys needed their mom, plus she lost her head over some general. Now I had two little boys, and they worshipped their mother. Was I going to ruin their lives over something like that? No, I couldn't do that. Plus, how different was one woman's infatuation with a national leader from my wife's possible infatuation with a man who clearly surpassed me in appearance and career? I decided I had to wait it out. I had time. If I want to go deeper later, I can do that. No, I'll wait and see. Now I will hope for Mira's love for me and her sanity. Mira walked into the kitchen, saw the flowers and reacted. Under normal circumstances, in our world before the new house and new job, flowers would have caused laughter, applause, perhaps some other silly tantrums and a big kiss. Not today. This time she came in, saw the flowers and sat straight down on the chair. She sat down, folded her hands in her lap, and began to shed tears. All I could say was that the expression of guilt and hopefully confusion was profound. I asked her, do you like them? Very quietly, almost inaudibly, she muttered, they are beautiful. God, I thought she was going to cry. Her reaction confirmed my fears. I just hoped she wouldn't go too far. The last thing I wanted today was a guilt-ridden confession. I walked over, picked her up, kissed her, and started trying to tickle her hard. My attempt to soften the moment worked. She giggled and squirmed. She hugged me and said cheerfully, You're terrible, you know that? I continued to tickle. The bus had just dropped off the boys, and they got on. 
Michael shouted, Hey, what's going on? His mother, now full of joy, although with a sense of guilt, said, Your father is being naughty. By then both boys had also joined the game. The three of us started working on Mira. She laughed and giggled and eventually burst into tears. The boys didn't know it, but I knew it. The tears were real. Myra may have rediscovered something about us, or so I hoped. I went back to work on Thursday, but called Allison. I asked how things were going. She said Wendell was a little distant, but otherwise well-behaved. I thought he was probably angry because he was missing out on free fun. Wendell needed to bring down his arrogance, and I had two good ideas. I asked Allison, your husband. He insists on being called by his full name, Wendell. Has it always been like this? Allison didn't understand where I was coming from at first. Yeah, mostly. His mother called him Deli when he was little, but he didn't like it. Deli, I thought, yeah, that's a bit much. I asked, have you ever called him anything else, like just Del? Oh no, he gets angry. Allison, start calling him Del tonight, see what he says. He'll get angry, he'll want to fight. I said, let it go, don't back down. Do you think this means anything, she asked. I think it might confuse him. I could almost see her smile over the phone. Okay, I'll try it, let me know how it goes. One more thing, I said. What, Steve? Sometimes, not too often, but sometimes, just mention me. She answered quietly, he will suspect. I added, also, I want you to invite Mira and our boys on Saturday. If it doesn't rain, we can use your pool. Mira wants to install a pool. We'll use that as an excuse. Allison said, and when we're all together, we can exchange notes. I said, yes, yeah, something like that. I had something else on my mind. I returned home Thursday night and was quiet, no new tricks or gimmicks. Mira needed a day off. However, later in the evening we received a call. I didn't answer, but a few minutes later Mira came in. It was Miss Standish. I smiled brightly and said, Allison? This threw Myra a little off balance, but she got over it. Yes, we were invited on Saturday if it doesn't rain. You must have said something, and she wants to show us their pool. I sat down. Great. Can we take the boys? Yes, she specifically said that boys were invited too. I said, Honey, why don't you buy one of those swimsuits like the one you wore on our honeymoon? You mean white? I said, Yes. She replied, I'll come back tomorrow, but I don't think white is a good choice. I winked. Whatever you choose will be a good choice. I was a bit of a creep, a bit. I added, Do you think Allison prefers a two-piece or a one-piece swimsuit? Myra ignored me. We went to bed a little later. No sex or anything, just some cuddling. I thought that maybe everything was going the way I wanted. Mira held me a little tighter than usual. I liked it. Friday passed without incident, and we found ourselves at the Standishes on Saturday. This was a big test for us. Our boys immediately found the pool and disappeared. Allison's children, Maureen and Jesse, were already in the water. To reassure Maureen, she was allowed to invite a friend. Her name was Jenny. So with five kids in the pool on a hot Saturday afternoon, we adults could sit under a couple of umbrellas and chat. Even though Allison continued to call her husband, Dell, I was pleasantly surprised at how polite he was. I brought up the topic of the name. I thought you preferred Wendell. Allison calls you Dell all the time. He grumbled. She suddenly has the urge to call me Dell. I chuckled. Well, that's better than what my mom called me. Mira remembered. Oh yeah, tell them what your mom called you. I pretended to be embarrassed. Oh, when I was little, she called me her little chicket coy. Later, for the sake of my dignity, she shortened it to Chicky, and much later simply to Chick. I looked at Mira and said, Don't laugh, I know what your mom and dad called you. Myra turned pale, No, Steve, don't. Allison asked me, No, what did they call it? I giggled, She was their peeper. Myra blushed all over. I asked Allison, 
What did your mom and dad call you? She blushed. They called me Muffin. We all laughed a little. Wendell laughed the least, but I think he was a little relieved. I also thought that maybe I had managed to take some of the August mystique out of our Mr. I'm So Special Standish. They had a radio or CD playing in the background. I asked Allison, do you have any favorite songs or artists? She replied, we love Barry Manilow. I said, really? Allison said, well, Del Mostly, I'm leaning more towards hard rock. Mira asked, oh, like ACDC. Wendell interrupted, them and, would you believe it, Guns and Roses? Myra said, wow, heavy metal. I had to interject, does anyone love Miranda Lambert? Wendell said, who? I said, Miranda Lambert, she's a country music star. You know, I cut my hair off with rusty kitchen scissors. Wendell interrupted me, oh, you mean the redneck stuff. Mira didn't like it very much. It's not redneck to like country music. I love Miranda Lambert and Carrie Underwood. I looked at Mira. It was something ours. I could afford to be generous. I listened to a little Manilow. I also like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. Wendell said, well, everyone loves old blue eyes. I've made my point. There were things that were just Mira and Steve. I think she understood. I could tell Wendell understood. He tried to think of an answer. It became something of a competition. Wendell said, you're a teacher, aren't you? I said, oh yeah. He had a plan, and I think I knew what it was. He added, you teach little kids in elementary school, right? I said, right again. He struck out, don't it get boring sometimes? I knew it was coming, and I knew my wife. I parried his blow and countered, look over there, I pointed at the pool, what do you see? He replied, children, why? Time for a knockout. This is not what I see. I see our future. More importantly, I see God. Have you ever listened to the beautiful sounds of a happy child? There is nothing more pure, more perfect than the innocent voice of a child. It's sacred. There's a divinity there that I can't explain. He fell into the trap of, Oh, I see what you mean. I understand God. I'm not into religion, though. Time to finish it. I agree, there is a God, and there is a religion. But I am not like Oru. I am more. He interrupted, who? Oh, I said, Voltaire. I mean Voltaire. He Latinized his name from the original French. I don't like his ideas about God. You know, the old stationary prime mover, blind watchmaker. I think God is active in our lives. He intervenes. Wendell raised his hands. Let's not talk about it. It was Mira's business. She began, We are believers, Steve and I. We believe that God is perfect, and because of this, he cannot touch us. We would taint him. So he sent us a mediator, that is Jesus. He did it in other ways at different times. The ancient Celts had a god named Lugus. The Egyptians had Osiris. I put my hand on Myra's. Let's change the subject. Allison chimed in. I believe the same as you too. I think God loves us and wants us to do the right thing. I said, yes, like the Ten Commandments. I figured if it didn't get attention, nothing would. Allison saw it too. Time for hamburgers. You guys fire up the grill. Mira, come with me. We'll get everything ready. She called to the pool. Children, it's time to go out. There is time. We spent the rest of the day chatting, chatting and even swimming a bit. Wendell was an excellent swimmer. I was good as long as my feet could touch the bottom. At about six o'clock, we collected the children and went home. I thought it was a pretty good day. Mira and the boys dozed all the way home. I thought about what I might have accomplished. Wendell was still Mr. Charm and Charisma, but I was hoping Mira saw some of the special connections she and I had, connections that exposed serious danger. Well, I thought, time will tell. A couple of weeks flew by. Mira came home on time or earlier every day. She missed both Friday happy hours. I didn't mention it, and neither did she. 
I called Allison again the next day at work and asked her to call my house a couple of times. I said to do it in the evening, and I will let Mira answer the call. She had to ask me, and if Mira asked why, I said to just answer something like, oh, nothing special. She did so, and Mira's reaction was predictable. I got the third degree. I also made sure to find reasons to leave the house a couple of times in the evening. Mira pretended she didn't care, but I knew better. I know my Mira. On Saturday after our swim festival, I took our boys for a ride in Mira's car. There was no particular reason other than one of those periodic safety checks that I believe all married men do when their wives drive. We went to the shopping center. I bought a latte. Each of my guys got a soda and a soft pretzel. When I returned, I saw that Mira had used my car for something, and she had parked at too high an angle. I moved the cars in the driveway so we could both get out. When I got into my car, I noticed that the Sunday panties I had left on the seat were missing. I found the bag, then the panties in the trash can. Mira never mentioned anything, but to my delight, I was in for some pretty creative sex play over the next few nights. I had a GPS in my car, and so did she. They were primitive by modern standards, but I think she tested mine several times. I knew she was watching me. Good for her. By the end of July, I had pulled the last rabbit out of the hat. Boys' camp is over. Myra's parents were looking after them, and they were already bored. I called Allison. We decided that we would take a short vacation, just six of us. Mira and Wendell had to work. Mira was a new employee and had no vacation days. I could take the rest of the summer without Allison working. The plan was to take the four kids with just Allison and I for a short vacation. There was a small lake resort about 40 miles away. We could rent two apartments, one for Allison and her two, and one for me and mine. We could canoe and swim and rent a couple of small sailboats to sail around for a bit. It could be fun, and we would leave the cheaters at home to stew in their own juices. I mentioned this to Mira. She didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. She thought I should work. She said we might need money. I assured her that it wouldn't be a problem. I explained that a new elementary school was opening in the district where I worked, and my name was first on the list for an administrative assistant position. With this, I explained, we will be fine. She didn't calm down. She gave one reason after another. Mira was scared. Even better, Mira gave me the same arguments that I gave her no more than eight months ago. What if something happens? What if there is an emergency? I told her she had no confidence. She should let me handle it. Don't be so insecure. I gave her the same answers that she gave me. Don't be so scared. Everything always works out. Of course, for her, it was not about money, it was something else. When Allison called, she said she received the same answer. Wendell needed her and the children at home. He will be lonely. She told him he could pretend he was alone. Maybe he can find a date while she's with me. She said that really made him angry. He got angry, but she didn't back down. It was pretty cool. The old insecurities seemed to be on the other foot. We planned to leave for four days. Allison loaded up her Excalibur, I loaded up my Explorer, and we were off. We stopped halfway and had lunch. The kids switched places, I got Maureen and Jesse and Allison got Mike and Jeremy. Mike called Mira while we were at lunch and talked non-stop about how much fun he had with Miss Allison. Now I wasn't stupid. Leaving Wendell and Mira for four days could be risky. I took this into account. Of course I had to admit it. They were changers. I knew it, Allison knew it, and Mira and Wendell probably knew we knew. But I was almost sure that whatever they were doing was long over, yet leave nothing to chance was my motto. I contacted a lawyer, and he gave me the information about the divorce. He even provided me with a package of documents. I made a copy for Allison and put the other one on my nightstand. I knew mine to the world, a package like that would be too tempting to leave alone. She will see it, open it, read it, and then the ball will be in her court. So Allison and I went on vacation with the kids. There was a plan for four days. It never happened. On the morning of the second day, I was walking out onto my third floor balcony when I saw Myra's Suburban pull up. She had a passenger. Yes, it was Wendell. 
I watched as they left and headed towards the office. Five minutes later, I heard a knock on the door. It was Mira. Around the same time, I heard someone knocking on Allison's door downstairs. I opened the door, and there she was. She said, you should come home. I pretended to be stupid. I asked, why, is everything okay? Nobody in the family, or? I never got around to finishing it. She said, you know why? She held up a packet of documents from the lawyer. This has to stop. I asked, what needs to stop? She said, you know, we need to get home. We need to talk. I took the package, leafed through it, closed it, looked at her and asked, what will it be, Mira? I could tell she was crying. She said again, please, just let's go home. I gathered my children and Allison gathered hers. I'm lucky. Mira arrived in her own car, so she had to drive back. Wendell got into the car with his wife and children. Mike and Jeremy wanted to go back with their mom. Mira, me, and the boys returned home. Her mom and dad were waiting for us at home to take care of the children. Once we were all set, Mira insisted that we go somewhere and have a long talk. We got in my Explorer and drove to a nearby Hampton Inn and got a room. As soon as we entered, Mira burst into tears. Sobbing and crying, she begged and pleaded, Oh, Steve, I'm so sorry. Please don't leave me. I love you so much. I just can't stand it, blah, blah, blah. I thought one day we would have this conversation. I planned what I wanted to say, but sitting on the bed, she cried and begged, eyes red and swollen, tears streaming down her cheeks. All I could think about was that beautiful, innocent girl I remembered. But... When she calmed down, I asked her, Did you think I wouldn't find out? She started crying again. I waited. When she calmed down, I said, Well. She sniffled and sobbed. I never thought, Oh my Steve, I just didn't think it. It was so. I asked, Was that what it was? She begged, Please don't do this, I'm begging you. I love you. I love our life together. I made a mistake, a big stupid mistake, the biggest mistake of my life. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I promise. I said, can you tell me one thing? She said, anything. I will say, do anything. I will be your slave. I will leave work. I will stay at home. I... I interrupted her. Tell me. She recovered a little. What? I asked, why? She started crying again. I handed her a napkin and said, any time. God, I was good. Finally, she pulled herself together. When she started, she spoke very quickly. It was hard to keep track. I don't know really. I mean, he was there. Everything was so different. Everything was so new. I mean, work. I wanted so. To please. We did Friday's things. He was like this. He was so confident, so sophisticated, so commanding. He knows so much about our work. He took me under his wing. He was so flattering. He praised my work. He said how beautiful I was and how practical I was. He thought I should be a lawyer like him. He said he would help me with my career. He said I shouldn't waste my talents, that he could open doors for me. I felt like he was my teacher. I interrupted. He was better than me. She stopped talking. She looked surprised puzzled, confused. She sobbed and began to breathe. I think she just realized one of the things she did to me. No, no, not no. Steve, oh no, honey, wait. No, he wasn't. Her eyes were as big as melons. She understood the implications of my question. Steve, no, please, not like that. He never. I mean, you're the best. My only one. Steve, I never thought. Not like that. I interrupted her rambling. You two were talking about me, weren't you? She trembled all over. She continued to squirm, sitting up and standing up. No, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, we were both talking about our spouses. He was talking about Allison as if she was some kind of only, some cold, frigid woman. I've never met her. I didn't know. I believed him. He seemed unhappy. I drank a little more than I should have. I think more than was necessary. I wanted to console him. I asked, 
Are you going to use alcohol as an excuse? She shook her head. Oh, no, I guess what I mean is that I was vulnerable. He was so important in the office. He was so authoritative, but when we were alone, when we were in the car, he seemed so sad. You were talking about me. What were you saying? I saw the wheels turning. I knew she was saying, don't lie to me. I'll know if you lie. Yes, she said. We talked about your work, how you spend the day with the children, how you don't face challenges. She stopped. Oh, Steve, he led me. I wanted to please him. He was my boss. I agreed with everything he said. He never said anything bad, but he, he said things about you, but it was always indirect, or it was like an unfinished sentence, and I filled it in empty place. I said then, he humiliated me and you let him. She sank. Yes, I think so. Oh, Steve, please forgive me. It was like I was under some kind of spell. I asked my wife, what do you think would have happened if I hadn't figured it out? She reached out to me, but I held her hands. She said, but I figured it out. I realized it at the barbecue on the 4th. I can't explain it. You were real. He was, like plastic. He liked to show off. He liked to talk about all the things he knew and could do. I looked at you and then at him and felt disgusting. She was doing well. It was touching, she said. How can I explain it? He was talking about all the things he had. I realized that if someone else mentioned someone, he knew him and knew someone something even more important. I thought the only way someone would mention more names than him would be to throw the phone book on the floor. I watched her. She took another deep breath and then, Darling, Steve, I get it. I mean, you two were close. He was bragging, and I thought, you never. I mean, you were bragging about me, the kids, but you never, you know. You're so you, you. I saw you and him. I saw, you're more courageous. I was confused. I saw it. He was fake. You were real. She sobbed. I was afraid she would have a seizure. I've seen her get so excited and upset that she'll just lose control and start shaking and trembling. She looked like that now. When this happened, it wasn't for show. It was real. This does not mean that she had a disease. The doctors said it was something like catalepsy, a mental thing where she seemed to disappear for a few seconds. She still behaved like that now, but she retreated. She became flowing in a wave of unrelated sentences. I was scared. I thought, what if I lose you? I was confused. When I saw you two together, it was like you opened my eyes. Oh, Steve, can't you see? She took a deep breath again. I was afraid she might hyperventilate and faint. This had happened before. She had the metabolism of a hummingbird, but she pulled herself together again. Steve, I realized then, at that barbecue I had, how much I love you. You were with Allison. She looked like she'd gone crazy. Cover of Maxim magazine. Compared to her, I felt like Frau. I was so jealous. I wanted to come and pull you away. I wished I could do it. She jumped over the bed. She was a nervous wreck. She hugged me. Steve, I'm sorry. I was scared. I'm scared now. I need you so much. I need you so much. You have to protect me. You can't send me away. Please don't do this, oh no. She started chattering again. I held her and listened. She said, I knew that same day that you knew. Don't ask me how I knew but I knew you saw it. You knew it right away, and I was so scared. I thought about what I did. I stopped that same day. We didn't do that much, only in his office. I watched her. She stopped and put her hands to her mouth. Oh, oh, I didn't mean that. I'm so stupid. I'll take it back. Please let me take it back. I realize that you are my life, Steve. I gently pushed her away and, looking down, raised my hands to my forehead and said, Mira. Mira grabbed my hands and pulled them away from my face and placed them on hers. Steve, you're the only man I want. You're my hero. I took her into my arms again. I stroked her head, her short, soft, blonde hair. I could smell her sweet scent. I put my hand on the back of my head. I stroked my left ear with my right thumb. I was just as scared as she was. I whispered in her ear, I love you, Mira. I love you more than my life. I would be afraid to live another day without you, but there is a problem. 
She leaned back, head tilted at an angle. What? She looked confused, stunned, like a deer in headlights. If there ever was one, she began again. Steve, I'll do anything. I'll be a better wife. I'll be a better mom. Trust me. Whatever this is, I can fix it. We let's fix this together. Together we can do anything. Still holding her, I said, It's not that simple. See, you know what you did. She interrupted me. Oh, I know. It will never happen again. I promise, I promise, I promise. She leaned over and quickly started kissing my face. I told her, I don't know that. See, you've lost my trust. She pressed herself close to me. I let her do that too. I continued, What if there's another Friday happy hour? What if there's another smart guy, another sophisticated, commanding, right person? What if he's single or divorced and completely available? What if he's rich? What if he offers something I can't offer? She hugged my waist tightly and pressed her face to my chest. She sobbed. Oh no, it will never happen again, no, never again. I thought, there's something special about a desperate woman, and Mira was definitely that. I said bluntly, trust, Myra, once it's lost, dot, 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 it quotes gone. Her response was more of a groan than an answer. Steve, I'll get him back. You'll see, I mean it. We're young, I'll prove myself. I'll prove myself every day. I felt as desperate as she did when I said, I want to believe you, I believe you today, but... I think it was unnecessary cruelty, but I went through a lot of pain. I think I did pretty darn well. I was pretty stoic throughout it all. I was nearing the end anyway. She looked at me expectantly. I had to put everything together, wrap it up, so to speak. I took a deep breath and told her, Mira, we can't go back. The past is the past, it's dead. We can end it now, a clean break, divorce, sort out finances, agree on custody, alimony, child support. Ordinary shit, and everyone will go their own way. She started crying again. She was crying, really crying. She literally withered away right in front of me. Or, she stopped and looked at me. She was completely breathless, as if she had been running at a fast pace. Or, I thought, this is it. If this were Hollywood, we'd probably have a prenuptial agreement. We'd hire a lawyer to lay out who would get what if we ever got divorced. They do it all. Time there. She looked puzzled again, so I continued. Sometimes people find themselves in situations like ours. One partner is unsure of the other and afraid that he may never be. In such cases, lawyers can sometimes draw up what is called a postnuptial agreement. She looked up post-nuptial. You see, we have a problem. The problem is trust. Suppose we let's reconcile. We move on, but then you, or I, we do something bad, we commit and do something we shouldn't. I mean, it could happen to me too. I doubt it, but it's a strange world. But suppose we sign an agreement. You cheat and you get caught. By legal agreement, you lose everything, all assets, access to children, the right to any child support, everything. Would you agree to sign something like that? I would. I would sign it today if we had a copy. She thought about it. You mean I'm cheating? Again, I lose everything if you cheat once the same for you. I nodded. We enter as equals. Not just you, it will be for me too. You would do it. You would make such a commitment even though you knew you would never do anything. Honestly, Mira, I don't think you'll ever do this either, not again. But it's a good idea. It'll be all or nothing. We'll make it a confidential agreement. No family members, no parents, no one will ever know. No loss of respect, no embarrassment, no humiliation. Would you agree to something like that? Finally, I felt her relax in my arms. The crisis was over. She started caressing my breasts. Signing something like that would be great. I want it. It's a good no, it's a great idea. Imagine, wow, and then someday when we're both old, we can take it out and laugh over this. I'll leave work. I'll give them notice tomorrow. I kept her at arm's length. Why? You worked so hard at that law firm. I have to try to trust. If you're going to betray me again, it wouldn't matter where you work. She asked, what about Wendell? I chuckled. 
You mean Della. I think Allison is taking care of that now. Mira hugged me again. Oh, Steve, I love you so much. You are so wonderful. You are the smartest and most wise person. It was nice. I liked the praise, but I continued. I had a few more things to settle. Okay, Mira, we can try a postnuptial agreement. We can start over, but I want to establish a few things. I married a free-spirited, smart, and assertive woman. I didn't marry some helpless woman, slave, on a person who would be afraid to even move if I frowned at her. I want my Mira, the fun, carefree real woman I fell in love with. I don't want you to be afraid. We will quarrel. We will have our moments, but as long as we love each other, as long as we remain faithful, I believe we will be fine. I want to believe in you. I think I can. I know I will have days where I might remember this and get angry, but I promise I will try to never use it as a weapon. You understand? Mira fell into my arms again. She whispered, I'm sorry. I interrupted, no more apologies, not for this. She jumped back. It was my peppy animated Mira. Okay, Steve, let's make a pact. We'll go back to our church, the church where we got married. Let's renew our vows. I want to do this. I want to tell you this again. I want to express my love and devotion. I mean to love, respect, and appreciate, abandoning all others, for better and for worse, for richer and for poorer, until death do us part, and then even after that let's do it. We please. And we did it. A few days later I was reflecting on all the events that had happened. Not only did I save my marriage, I may have saved Allison's marriage too. With God's help, my boys will grow up in a stable, loving home, and the fantasy to which every child is entitled, the belief that their parents have always been faithful, faithful and honest, will never be tarnished. I've read that there are no guarantees, but children who grow up in stable homes are more likely to stay true to their marriage vows when they get married themselves. Last but not least, I really loved Myra. I was willing to take the chance that she wouldn't break our vows again. As they say, if you deceive once, shame on you, if you deceive twice, shame on me. I was almost sure that she would pass this test. I didn't force her to come back. She herself interrupted it and returned. I did this. Am I a weakling? I didn't think so. I had to compete with half the men in the state to win her the first time. I certainly wasn't going to hide in some corner and die because of one idiot like Wendell Standish. Did we sign a prenuptial agreement? No, we never signed. Oh, that's not entirely true. We got one. We signed it. We even kissed when we signed. But it lies in a box in the attic along with a package of documents from a lawyer. This happened a long time ago. The boys are now in high school. Oh, and we had another child, a little girl. Myra quit her job when our little Sally Ann was born. She says she will not return to work. And I'm still just a vice principal in a small primary school. Just a nobody, I think. But it's normal. I don't know what Wendell and Allison said to each other after we left the resort. All I know is that they didn't break up. I also know that Allison followed through on my last piece of advice. Allison and Dell signed a postnuptial agreement. We're still friends and Allison keeps Dell on a short leash. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.